Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you get any message on the like a message saying it's media being recorded? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 So yeah, the is going to be on my computer. There you go. And then I can share it with you. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can do it last day. Very well. Yeah, good. Yeah. So I think we should start. Um, I hope everything is working out here. Okay. Um, okay. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's a I'm really happy that this is finally happening. It's a great pleasure to introduce Matilda uh, Martoli. Uh, Matilda is a, a mathematical uh, physicist in uh, Caltech with an interest in uh, mathematical linguistics. Recently, she has co-authored no less than three papers with um, Bob Berwick and uh, Noam Chomsky trying to distill the algebraic properties of uh, of syntactic merge and then using the insights from that uh, kind of think about semantics and other things um, since this was a you know it's an interdisciplinary um, attempt bringing together mathematics and linguistics um, we thought it's extremely interesting I really kind of uh, uh, several of us really wanted to um, learn more about this work um, but we thought that you know, obviously one talk um, is not going to do justice because you know uh, there is have some heavy mathematics going on here and the linguistics uh, part of it is also not exactly um, trivial in any way. So we thought that it's kind of good to have extended, be able to have extended discussion and kind of give Matilda enough time to actually kind of go over the work and kind of do it justice. So this is the first meeting that we are having. We are going to have meetings one per, you know, for the rest of the week, every day. Um, I assume you've seen the announcements. If you have any questions, ask me. Um, the, both the time of the day in which the meetings are going to take place and the location are somewhat uh, subject to variation in different days because we had difficulty kind of finding a room at the same time. So please kind of keep that in mind. Um, and yeah, so that's it. Thank okay. you. Okay, so thanks, thanks a lot for the introduction and, and for the invitation. And so I want to just start out by saying that, of course, everything that I'm talking about is this joint work with Norm and with Bob. And, you know, both of them have been some amazing, wonderful collaborators. And this has been like one of the like, nicest collaboration experiences in my life. And uh, it's also been like one of the nicest things that I, I have been thinking about, actually. You know, I worked on various different things, physics, and mathematics, and all that stuff. But, and so, I mean, my my you know goal here is that I would like to convince you why I think that this is so nice. Okay, and of course, also you know, 
No, thanks a lot for inviting me here because I, I'm really happy to be able to present this here before and doing that anywhere else, you know, my collaborators. And so, okay. Um, so, oops. Matilda, if someone asks a question, you yeah. want me to ask you? Okay, you don't have to, uh, okay. yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so, the the material that I'm talking about is available in three papers. All three of them are on the archive. They're also on the linguistics and the plus archive. And uh, so I will more or less try to cover as much as possible of all three of you know, the papers. And uh, so yeah, you, know, you should be able to access all that material easily. But basically, so here's, here's the thing. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is this specific model of linguistics, syntax specifically, and we also talk well, at some point about interface between syntax and semantics, which is Chomsky's well, merge and strong minimalist thesis. So you can find the linguistics background for what I'm, what I'm talking about in this other short book that's uh, just just come out in print, right? In Cambridge from, from this year. And our stuff is uh, also going, well, it, we just submitted it. So it's still, it's still going through the directory process and all that, but hopefully it's also gonna come out as a book. And, and these two things are the same thing. So the, the actual you know, linguistic theory is the same. And the, the, this, this other side is sort of presented uh, through this uh, lens of through this viewpoint of, a mathematical, of the mathematical structure. So of course, you know, um, I know that you might want to ask the question, which is, well, you have, you have a, a a theory that's presented in a book of about a hundred pages, you know, in the in, in the standard you know, linguistic formulation. And you have a kind of a version which is about 300 pages and, and counting, uh, which has <laughs> mathematics in it. So I know that maybe someone's good asking whether it's uh, truly necessary to have a, a factor of three of expansion for filling up this stuff with, with mathematics. Okay, so I, I'm not gonna make light of this question. It's a, it's a legitimate and serious question. And, and I actually wanna try to answer it. And uh, the, the, the short you know, short slogan for by what I'm gonna try to argue for is that you know what 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 we've been showing is that all these all the linguistic aspects of this model have a precise mathematical formulation and, and the precise mathematical counterpart. And that properties, desirable properties of the model from a linguistic point of view, they just fall into place by sort of structural necessity of intrinsic consistency of the algebraic model. And that is the main point that I wanna you know, present, which is the fact that so, I mean, this, I, I come from a background as a you know, mathematician and theoretical physicist, and, you know, theoretical physics over the course of, of say, most of the past century and, and, and counting, mm -hmm. it uh, has made extensive use of this principle that you let the algebra do the heavy work for you and produce for you a highly constrained system in which a lot of things fall into place by necessity. And then you test that against your you know, physical reality as a model of physical reality. So you know the, the, this is this is actually the viewpoint that we've been trying to follow. And what what is so what does one gain? You know, summarizing you know, the, as a as a program you know, for for what I what I've been showing. What does one gain by using more? explicit mathematical formulas. Well, first of all, you know, what, what is mathematics? You know, by definition, mathematics is the study of structures. This might sound 
depending on your background, might sound a little surprising or not. I mean, if you walk up to the first person in the street and you ask them what is mathematics, they will probably answer that it's something about numbers. And that's not true. Well, I mean, of course, numbers are a part of it, but the only reason why numbers are a part of mathematics is because numbers are interesting structures. And mathematics is the studying of structures. Okay, so numbers are interesting structures, and so does language. And therefore, it can also be looked at from that perspective. Okay. Also, of course, you know, you, even, even what I said about you know, this, this you know, translation into mathematical formalism, well, that we been doing, you know, I, I have been asked you know, frequently in this, this last few months whether you know, this means that generative linguistics is becoming more mathematical. It's not, it's, it's always been. And not just because of the old story of formal languages, which has become you know, a well-established field of mathematics and all the, the theorems, you know, that no one proving about formal languages early on and, and then you know, people also study, but you know, also the more, the more recent formulations of generative linguistics have a highly, a highly structured mathematical content, which is not always immediately apparent because like you know, non paper are written for an audience of linguists. They're not written for an audience of mathematicians. Unfortunately, I would say, because you know, I find it very surprising that there actually hasn't been more interaction with mathematicians you know, before, after the old story of the formal formal language. But the point is that it's not becoming more mathematical. It always was, and, the, and it's right in front of your eyes if you look at it from, from the right perspective. And that's one of the things that I, that I want to explain. And what is good about that? Well, you know, there, there's this thing, this is, this is exactly what theoretical physicists understood a long time ago, that mathematics is, you know, a really powerful explanatory tool because at the same time, it's extremely constrained and extremely flexible. And so it's a, it's a good way to model you know, various type of phenomena because it's flexible enough to accommodate whatever you want, but it's rigid enough to actually you know, tell you exactly what the constraints are and exactly what comes you know, as, a, as a consequence of the, the mathematical structure and what are the things that you need to assume independently. Of course, no. They, they said in physics, this idea is very old. I mean, Galileo used uh, to say that the, the universe is a book that is written in the language of mathematics. And and as a physicist, no, I strongly believe that. Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have become a physicist. And uh, but you know, what the, what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean that the universe is a book that's written in the language of mathematics? It means that you know, the same kind of fundamental structures are going to come up over and over again in different contexts. And you know, you know that when you encounter the same mathematical structure in two very different contexts, context, it is a sign that you stumble upon something which is a kind of universal law of nature. And so one thing that we've been observing is that some of the structures that uh, you know are arise naturally in the setting of generative linguistics are in fact exactly the same structures that are known to physicists, and they arise in certain uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a little. They arise in certain contexts in theoretical physics where you actually have a very similar situation. You have a generative process of certain combinatorial objects. You know, in, 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 in linguistics, they are like syntactic objects. In physics, there are things like Feynman diagrams. But you know, they, they're kind of governed by, by similar kind of universal laws of nature. And that allows you to use the same kind of mathematical formalism to talk about points. OK. So this is well, on the stack. Well, of course, this is this is a well-known fact for for, for you know, linguists that you know the the way that we want to think about language is that not as a as strings of words, you know, in order ordered strings of words. Of course, eventually it is like when I'm when I'm speaking, I'm you know, putting together 
and a time order string of words. But what actually matters is not the time order sequence, but it's the structural you know, uh, relations that, that exist between these words, which are not not so much correlated to the to their um, structure as an as an order of string. And so what language actually looks like is more of this kind of a you know, colder mobile sculpture where you have your you know structural relations in form of the tree. And you know, you should really think of this tree as hanging out there and not being you know plainly embedded. That's right. So, all right. So what does does, how does, does I, that idea, you know, the size of, you can get that idea now more precisely. So the first type of uh, structure that you want to uh, consider is syntactic objects. So this, you know, is, uh, I'm, I'm going to follow the notation, so this kind of also called free, free symmetric merge. I guess there have been ideas around asymmetric merge that, that uh, existed over the years. I think Andrea you know, have done something at some point and some other issues. So I'm, I'm, I'm following strictly this recent formulation that no one had starting, I think, with this paper from 2019 and more of papers that ended this monograph that I mentioned. So you think of this as being uh, a, a kind of basic structure building operation which is also one refers to as binary set formation in the, in the linguistic literature. And it kind of you know, assembles lexical items into structures in a recursive way. And, and syntactic objects are whatever you obtained by repeatedly applying this, this procedure. Yeah. And these are unordered you know, structures in the sense that you know, these Beta and beta alpha would be would be the same. Okay, so this this thing is something that's actually very well known to mathematicians. It has a it has a specific name in, in mathematics. It's called the free non-associative commutative magma on a on a given set. So the, what that means is that you know, I, I'm just saying the same thing that I said a moment ago. You know? You start with a given set of lexical items, a lexical item and syntactic features. Actually, let me just call it lexical items for simplicity. And you have a, a binary operation, a binary operation that is commutative and non-associative. So commutative is just the first property that you flip the arguments and stays the same, and but it's non-associative. So if you compose one way or compose the other way, you don't get the same. Thing. And uh, so this this is not an operation on the lexical items themselves. So when you apply you know, you, one of these objects, it's not itself a lexical item. It's a structure that's formed out of lexical items. So you keep iterating this procedure with the idea that there are no further relations except between these objects that you create, except this commutativity relation. That's what it means that it's a free associative non-commutative magma. It means that. That's the only relation that you have between these objects. The, the, everything else, there the, are no, the no other relations. And so syntactic objects are the elements of the free non-associative commutative magma generated by the lexical items. And so all the elements that are obtained by repeatedly applying this, this binary operation on this set. So mathematicians also know these objects under a different name. And it's it's another fact that's known in mathematics is that the free non-associative commutative magma on a given set X is the same thing as the set of abstract binary rooted trees with leaves that are decorated by elements of this set. And so that Abstract means exactly what I what I was saying about the the other mobiles sculpture that you know these are not these are trees that are, don't come with an embedding in a plane, so you should think of them as like floating around like that, and uh, and other than that they are binary so all the, all the branching are just two two branching and they are rooted. So syntactic objects are abstract binary of the trees with leaves decorated by the elements of the set of lexical items. 
so I'm gonna you know just switch between you know the this notation with the brackets and this notation with the with the trees where you no know, when I write the notation in the trees one should really remember that so you write it in the plane but you don't mean that that you have a choice of embedding in the plane okay okay so this is this was the first the first bit syntactic objects so the next thing is something that's called works workspaces. So the, the way this is described, you know, going back to the monograph, you know, monograph in Welsh and the in the strong you know, species, these are uh, you know described as, as the, the the place where sentence sentences are built, right? So sentences are built by you know repeated application of merge operation on workspaces. So one you know starts with this this uh, set of lexical items or has this this uh, structure formation that creates syntactic objects, and syntactic objects are you know put together in in, in a workspace. So a workspace is some kind of like computational scratch pad that is a set. In fact, a multi set because you can have you know several syntactic objects that are isomorphic to each other, and uh, and the merge operations take the workspace as input and give you a new workspace as output. And your your process of, uh, of sentence formation is a sequence of transformation of the workspace into a new workspace that terminates into something that has a completed sentence. So so there's the there's the the well the end that you had in your definition of the magma how's it called am I like getting the word right? So the end that you had that that's separate from merge. That's that's a, a yeah. So, so right. So yes, in a sense, so you have this operation that constructs the the syntactic objects. Okay. Of course, it is itself like a manifestation of, of merge. It's sort of similar like to what the external merge is going to be. But no, the the thing is that. You want to think of this as as being like two two separate things. One is one is you know generating these these combinatorial structures that are the syntactic objects, and and then you have these operations on workspaces, and of course this operation is going to use this fact that you have this this you know multiplication you know, on on this magma. It's going to be going to be part of how you define you know the, the merge operation on workspaces. But I, I want to argue why you you actually want to have the structural workspaces, why it actually turns out to be to be playing you no know, a necessary role in in the, the algebraic analysis. But and, and then I'll go on to how you you see the action of merge in that in that setting. Yes. So should we think of the workspace as for a particular sentence, or do we think of it in the same way as the magma as the set of all? structures that you're building on. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah so I yeah yes so I'm gonna tell you in a moment what the set of workspaces is which is the analog of the magma right the magma is the set of syntactic objects with its structure so yeah you have the set of syntactic objects come with its own algebraic structure which is this magma mm -hmm. operation right? and that's the one that, that gives you the generative process for the syntactic objects. The the workspaces so this, the set of workspaces also comes with an algebraic structure, which I'm going to describe in a minute. Okay. Okay. So, so let me again make the the translation of what I just said in this uh, language that that uh, mathematicians speak. And so, what I just said about what workspaces are, you know, translates into the following. That uh, workspaces are binary forests. So, what 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 is a binary forest? It is a finite disjoint union of abstract binary rooted trees. And you know, so each you know it has it has components you know which in the in in the in on papers and in, in linguistic literature they are called members of the workspace. Mathematicians call them connected components of the forest or just components of the forest. And so the way the way you view a workspace is something like, like this example, right? 
here you have a, a workspace that consists of three syntactic objects. And you know, the order, order doesn't matter, right? And and planar structure of the trees doesn't matter. So you can you can reorder things that you want, you can flip flip them uh, whichever way you want in the in the planning stage. Okay. So that's that's what workspace gets. So is that it's the it's the power set of this uh I think it's curly T, right? With, with such that it's closed under union or or yeah, so these these are you know the this T so this so the what I'm calling T is the is the set of binary rooted trees. So it's it's the set of syntactic objects. Right? And what I'm gonna call F. Uh, these these uh, gothic letters they all look the same, but okay. This uh, <laughs> F is is the set of all you know finite disjoint unions of elements in the of of syntactic objects or so of binary yeah. objects. Yeah, that's right. So it's the finite right. Finite disjoint unions. Yeah, arbitrary finite disjoint unions. All right. So you no, know, if if we Describe it in this form. Then, what we want to describe as merge operations is. I'm, I'm confused by the notation. Okay. Because each of the syntactic objects is a set, right? Each of the syntactic, syntactic object? object is a set in, in the. Or, or is that stuff that you. No, did so it's, it's a, what I'm saying is that it's the same to think of it as with this curve, you know, bracket yeah. notation set, or to think of it as an abstract binary rooted tree. It's the same in the sense that that are isomorphic, but but yeah, they're canonically isomorphic. So, so yeah. you know, you you yeah, they are kind of indistinguishable. Yeah, though. No, so, but but just when you said it's the union of, of right. these so, things, I mean, so what do we mean by if you want if you want to use the same notation yeah. that that Nam is using in the in the um merge and the strong minimal thesis, you would like you would write these uh. Okay. <laughs> you can write if you find the band that writes. Uh, you would write these just a warning that it's very hard for those of us on Zoom to read the whiteboard. At the moment I can read what you have there. But if you start okay. using the whiteboard more, it's going to be impossible. Now, right now is, like, like the first, the first, you know, syntactic object in this workspace in this notation. So the the notation that you would see in that book is that this is your workspace. There is this, and then there is this this other one. Yeah, sorry for the that you cannot see the the board, but. Uh, I'm just you not know, gonna write out that the thing like you know that we just like this. Okay. And this of course is all the all the different from the other ones. And and there's a third one. Okay. So this this is what, what you would see. It's the same thing. So you know if for for uh, the, that that's just you know a different notation for for what I wrote there. Well, where I, I have not written the, the the labels on the on the leaves, but yeah. So, but what is unions of of these things? So, when you say finite disjoint unions, uh, what, um... yeah, this is this is just you know when you, when you see, you, know, yeah. you can think of this list as being the list of the components of these of this forest. So, you know, when I when I say disjoint union, you can say this, you know. Different connected components. Okay, is this, is this kind of okay as a, as a, you know the translation between this? The... Yeah, like, like this is th thought these were just like these are sets of syntactic objects. I'm trying to understand why I can't simply say that. Why why this? Uh... No, you can say you can say that this yeah. workspace is a is a multi set. Multi -set. It's a multi set yeah. of syntactic objects. Yeah. That's okay. That it's a, it's an equivalent description. Okay, so okay. It, it, I, it's the reason like, why I wanna uh, I wanna use this description yeah. in terms of forests yeah. is 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 for the reason that's gonna come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just that it's a it's a more convenient notation for because 
you know, there, there, there is already this kind of algebraic structures that deal with forests, uh, with trees and forests. And, and then I'm just going to use that in, in a second. So it's convenient to you know, phrase it. But if, if you want to think no, of no, them no, as multi sets. Like there, are, there are symbols there that I don't know what they mean, like this, like this T, I, and they're connected to each other by. Oh, no. by, by this, how do you call by the, it? By the, the disjoint union. Yeah, yeah. So what does the disjoint union mean? Yeah, I mean, if you have two sets, yeah. right? If you take the union, well, it, so when you want to describe what the union of two sets is, you've got to have some kind of a listing of their elements, right? Because the union could, could have some common intersection. But if you just have abstract sets and you don't want to have to, really have to list their, their elements, right? The only operation that, that you have that puts them together is this, this joint union because the disjoint union doesn't you know, care about any overlap of sets. You just have two, two. Well, so the joint union just means unions of sets that are presupposed to have no intersection or something like that? Right, exactly. The, you, you don't, so you could, you could think of this as being, I don't know, you know two sets where you take a, you know, you take a product with two different points so that you know that they, you force them not to have any intersection, right? Okay. So you, you take, a, take a union where you, where you even if you, if you could list the elements that would be common elements, you are, you are placing them in such a way that they don't intersect. Okay. So that's why you, know, you think of these as like separate, separate pieces. I mean, of course, these when you think of them as trees, you can also think of them as having a topology, so it's disjoint even in the, in the topological sense. But this is not, not important. So. Okay, so the point is that now we want to think that merge is taking an input, which is a binary forest, and it's going to give you an output, which is another binary forest. Okay, so. Linguistically speaking, why does one want to have workspaces and not just not just syntactic objects? Why why do one have put them together in workspace? So the, the the main reason is that you know when you when you think about well there, there's this process of structure formation which for which syntactic objects are what you get so just this, this marginal operation, but that's not all that you want to describe. You also want to describe certain kind of movement and transformations that you can do on, on you know, segments. Yes. Right. So basically you want to have something that's like internal merge. The, the magma operation is something that well, would, would account for you know, external merge, but you, know, you want to you wanna be able to also account for something that, that describes movement and transformations. And that you need, for that, you need something like internal merge. And so in, in the linguistic setting, you say that the reason why to introduce workspaces is because you know, if you want to do this kind of transformations, you have to you know, be able to extract some structures from your syntactic object, not just take them as a, as a wall. In the, in the magma structure that generates the syntactic object, you don't have an operation that extracts substructures. It's not part of, of, the, of the algebraic setting that yeah. generates the syntactic object. So you need to move things to another algebraic setting where you have an operation that extracts substructures because that's what you need to do this type of internal merge operation. And so the, the, the kind of substructures that are required for, for the merge action are, are called accessible terms in the, in the linguistic literature. So let's try to view that a little bit more from the mathematical perspective. So here we have again an example of a workspace with three components. And what are the accessible terms? So the, the way they are defined in, uh, again, in most papers and uh, is, is the following way. So you look at some trees. So you, you have a syntactic object. You think of it as, as the binary with a tree. So I'm already giving you the, the mathematical translation of all yeah. these aspects. So you have a you have a syntactic object which is one of these abstract binary rooted trees. So you hang it there from the root, and then you look for one of the vertices somewhere below the root. You pick a vertex and you pick everything that's hanging below that vertex. Okay. So everything that's hanging below that vertex is an accessible term. 
All right. So you have one accessible turn for each of the vertices below the root. And the way you define the accessible turns of the workspace, not of a single syntactic object, but of the workspace, it's all the accessible terms of every object and the entire component of each object. Um, so we, we have a workspace and then we define a notion of accessible terms. Right. As opposed to you know something else one could do, which is to say everything in the workspace is accessible. Yeah, that's right. So you don't you don't exactly want everything. So first of all, you have to say what it, what does you mean by everything in the workspace, right? And I, I, I'll come to that in a second, you know, to to make this this distinction more precise. Because when you say everything in the workspace, if you're if you're thinking of your workspace as a multi set of syntactic objects, then you would be tempted to say that everything in the workspace me, means any syntactic object in this multi set. Mm -hmm. But then you would only be able to extract an entire component and not a substructure of that component. Right? But but this is on the assumption. I mean, assuming that you know merge moves from you know you, you give it one workspace, it gives you another workspace. You know, conceivably, uh, you know, if there is like a uh, you know, let's say there's like a big tree in the current work workspace, that big tree resulted from putting together two smaller trees in a previous workspace. So if those previous trees are also in the new workspace, so we, in the new workspace, we have both the smaller trees and the putting together of them. Okay, this, this then automatically we have... No, this is one way to think of what, what accessible terms are, right? They are, they are substructures that come from previous, you know, assembling of your... Uh, no, that's exactly why you take this thing that I'm thinking below vertices, because those are exactly the substructures that come from previous iterations of your you know, structure formation operation and you might not get to the, the entire synthetic object. But the point is that they are not elements of the workspace if you think of it as a motion set because elements are then just the just the synthetic objects. And so you want something that is is actually you know extracting these substructures from the synthetic objects. Okay. So I, I'm going to tell you in a moment what that is. I mean, there, there's actually something that is precisely designed to do to do that. And, but I, I just want to tell you what the motivation is. This is what you want to do. You want to have an extraction of substructures from the workspace. Okay. And I'm saying these are the kind of substructures that you want to do. Yes. Uh, if I each of these red circles is a substructure there. So that's also an element of. Yeah, yeah, so the, all the, the, the circle, the, the red circles, right, are examples of accessible terms. So every accessible term is a workspace in a way because they're also. Yeah, so all the red ones are accessible terms of, also of the individual syntactic objects. The example of the, the, the last one, the yellow one, that picks an entire component that counts as an accessible term of the workspace. Right. It, not of the syntactic objects itself because it's not a, it's a substructure of the workspace, but it's not a sub substructure of that so a proper right. substructure of that syntactic. So object. any workspace can be an accessible term as long as it's not it doesn't have a their root, right? So okay, fine. Okay, so so let let, let me give give the the formal definition of what this drawing is showing. Okay, so the formal definition is that if you have a syntactic object and you have a vertex, you know you can look at the subtree that's rooted at that vertex. And if you take any known root vertex, what you get is one of these accessible terms. If you throw in the entire component as well, then the union of these give you the accessible terms of the workspace. So this is the formal definition of what accessible terms are. Okay, okay so now what, what type of structure do these objects you know, uh, realize? Right? What type, what is the, the, the structure that governs these objects? In the, if you want, as I said, you know, if you want just this, the syntactic object, we know what is what is the, the structure that governs them, which is this, this magma operation. What is the structure that governs these work, workspaces with accessible terms? So what the answer is that the, the relevant structure here is a whole problem. So I'm I'm gonna so get into what that means, but this is this is what these things. It will actually describe the properties of these objects. Okay. So before I before I get into 
how these things are hot algebra and what actually is a hot algebra. <laughs> Let me just give like a, a, a brief you know, idea of what it is. So these, these are algebraic structures that have been introduced in mathematics to describe various kinds of situations where you have composition and decomposition operators at the same that you want to consider at the same time. So a half algebra structure is an algebraic structure that models you know, ways of assembling and disassembling certain kind of objects. They have a lot of use in combinatorics because very often when you deal with various classes of combinatorial objects, what you want to know is how they are assembled and how they are disassembled into their basic constituent building blocks. And, and usually that description is given in terms of one of these structures. And so the composition, the composition translate into this language into two algebraic operations. One is the product operation, like multiplication of numbers. Like I give you, I give you two inputs, and and you get an output by multiplying them together. So multiplication is is a is a something that has two inputs and is an operation that has two inputs and one output. And correspondingly, this is how you assemble things. And correspondingly, you want to have a way of disassembling things, and that's it called the co-product. And that's exactly the opposite thing. It's something where you input one object and it outputs for you a decomposition of this object into, into two pieces. It breaks this object apart into two pieces. So it's something with one input and two outputs. Okay, and there's a, and, and you gotta have a compatibility between these two operations. The compatibility is a little subtle because you know, at first you want to think that what it means to have a, a, a assembling operation and a disassembling operation that are compatible, you would be tempted to say that you want to you want you know if you if you do one of them and then the other to get back the same thing that you started with. But this is actually not what you want. What you want as compatibility is something that tells you that you know, if you first compose and then decompose, or you first decompose and then compose, these, these two give you the same result. But the same result is not necessarily what you started with. Okay, I'll, I'm, go, I'm gonna be more precise about this, but I just, just, just wanna make this point that they are not inverse operations of each other. So regarding the code product, um, it, on the slide it says it lists all possible ways of decomposing and not in parts. And so you're leaving back a set of, uh, way you could have composed the thing together. Yeah, right? exactly. So there's one thing that I that I haven't said yet, which I'll, I'll, I'll say in a moment, that you know, if normally what happens is that if I give you two things and I tell you to uh, uh, assemble them together, there's there's a unique recipe right. for doing that. And so you so you can just define this on the set of you know, saying, okay, these are the things, you multiply them together, and this is the result. But when you when you want to disassemble things, normally what happens is that there are many different ways in which you can disassemble things. So you have to keep that into account in in, in the structure. And indeed, this 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 is something that I'm getting to okay. I'm getting to in a second. And but let, let let's let's get you know back more concretely to exactly the case of the workspaces, so we can see we can see what what we're what we're actually doing. So what is the operation that assembles? workspaces. It's exactly this disjoint union operation that I tell you. Because how how am I the way I define what a workspace is is something that I built by taking syntactic of taking a finite number of syntactic objects and putting them together in a workspace. So that putting them together is what I want to be my product operation. It's the way that I form workspaces, right? And in particular, this also means that I have one workspace and another workspace, I can put them together into a single workspace by the same disjoint union operation. Okay. Why do we want this to be associative when the underlying magma is not associative? So here we have a community. Okay, so part. this operation of, of disjoint union is, is very nice because it is both commutative and associative. Okay. Simply because, yeah, if I, th there's nothing I have to worry about. I think if I take my two, two, no, my little trees, I form a forest, 
and the order doesn't matter. So you no know, commutativity is fine. But also if I put these two there and I put another one next to them, or, or I put these two and I put another one next to them, it's the same. So it's both associative and commutative. So this product is is not unlike the, the unlike the, the structure formation of the single syntactic object, which is non-associative. Now the, the syntactic objects I have as given, and I'm I'm assembling them together into workspaces, and this product operation is not nicer in the sense that it's also so skin. It has it has less structure to it. That's you know the, Yeah, I'm not yeah, I'm, the, yeah. like, I'm not no I'm yeah. not merging yeah. them yeah. I'm just I'm yeah. just like listing them in, yeah. into my workspace. That's why that's why it's such a simple operation. Right? No. Okay, so th so this is what I want as product. It's it's a very very simple thing. Yes. Um, if you take two, uh, you know, I, I understand what it means to have two trees and create the forest. I understand what happens if you have two forests. And well, I'm not sure if I understand. These are different operations. Like if I give you two trees and give me the forest, like basically the list of those two trees, that's one operation. But then if I give you two lists and then you put the list together, you give me a third list, that's a different operation. No, no it's, it's still the same because you see, in particular, a single tree is a. Uh, and, and there, there is this, you know, it's, it's, it sounds funny, right? There, there's a combinatorics books that's, that's saying a tree is a connected forest. Oh. Which is true. <laughs> a tree is a connected forest. That kind of uh, walk in the woods. <laughs> and, you know, they, so in particular, the, the disjoint union that puts the, the trees together into a forest is a particular case of the disjoint union that puts two forests together to form another forest. So, so what I just so what I need to wrap my head around is that trees are forests. They, yeah. Trees are a kind of forest. trees are forests that have a single connected component. Okay. Yeah. This this is just saying that when you write workspaces in this way, you also have in particular the workspaces that contain a single syntactic object. For example, the end of your derivation where you where you end up with a with a single sentence. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so, what, so those are, are the forest with the consistent. So, I, so I just to kind of make sure. So I, I, I think what confuses me is that I'm, in my head I'm drawing a distinction between a tree and a forest that only contains that tree. Like yeah. in my head I'm no, distinguishing. That's right. So but at this point, no, when, when, you, when, you, when you are in this set of uh, binary forests, this set of binary forests also contains a copy of the set of binary trees mm -hmm. as the forest with one component. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, I'm so sorry. Can I interrupt? This is, I'm, I'm on the screen. I'm not understanding the associativity. If I if I if I put x and y together and and then add z, that's a different constituency from putting. Uh, well, but you know if. if Putting um, y and z together and then x. I'm, I'm, but what am I missing? No, we're putting putting together in what sense? I mean, putting together That's as what disjoint. I'm yeah, no, exactly. So putting together as this joint union of sets, then it is the same thing. You, you should think of it like this: like you have. No, I, I got. I got it now. I see. The, the disjoint is crucial. It's the disjoint union that is associative, not not the the magma merge. That's not a non-associative. The disjoint. <laughs> No, finish. I'm sorry. Hmm? I, I didn't okay. mean to interrupt. Sorry? I, I I accidentally interrupted your question. I didn't mean to continue for your response. Okay. okay. All right. So okay, I think we're fine with what the what the product should be. Okay. Now what what about the co-product? How are we gonna disassemble these workshops, these for work spaces? Okay. And so the, the, the first observation that I want to come back is what Jeff was saying that you know you you naturally are gonna have many different ways in which you can disassemble your object and you wanna be able to consider all of them at the same time. So you need some kind of algebraic trick to be able to consider all these possibilities at the same time and as a as a kind of combination of all possibilities. Okay. So th this is this is a an obvious algebraic trick that's used all the time. So you have this uh, this set of uh, of forests, and you form a, a, a vector space over this set. So you you just 
know, allow yourself in freedom of writing formal linear combinations of this set with coefficients in whatever you want, some some rational numbers or some mean integers, whatever. It's it, it's a purely formal thing. It's just a way of saying that if you have many different possibilities that you want to simultaneously consider, you just write it formally as a sum. And it's like, you no, know, you think of these as vectors. So you have like all your different vectors and you, know, you can form a sum of them. Yes, you know, it's, a, it's a purely formal thing, but the, the, the issue is that you need to do that because your co-product is not gonna have a single possibility as output, unlike your product. Your product, you could just define it on the set. It, it doesn't matter, but you know, when you want to list the possibilities out of as outputs of your product, it's convenient to just list them as a sum, and that's 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 all there is. Okay, so the product you can extend it to this vector space formally by linearity, you know, in the variable, and the and the co-product, you know, you just write it out as uh, as you know a sum of all possibilities. And normally, one writes it out like this, where you have one trivial possibility, like if you want to split your object in two ways, you just don't split it. So you put it as it is, one, one place or one way or the other. Okay, so this is like the, the trivial one in which you're, if you only have that part and you don't have anything else, you're, what you're saying is that this is an object that is indecomposable. There's no way to split it apart. If you, okay, you just have to take it as it is. Okay. These are called the primitive elements, which are exactly the ones that are indecomposable. If it's not indecomposable, then you know, in addition to the, the trivial possibilities, you have the non-trivial possibilities of decomposing them, and you write them as a sum with, with one piece and the other piece of the decomposition on the two channels of the co-product output. Yes. The reason we want to have a co-product instead of something like that builds two separate structures instead of say an outer product that just creates one structure of a higher order in some way. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to I'm okay. talk more about that that in a second. But so this is just formally how you write how you write this decomposition. Yeah, I'll I'll have the back. I promise. Okay. Um, so so. So then let's let's say how we want to do what we want to do with with workspaces when we want to decompose them. So the the the, sim, the most simple minded thing that that you can try to do is to say okay if I have put together my workspaces by combining you know various syntactic objects in the same multi set I can decompose them by extracting these various syntactic objects. And of course, you see right away that this is not what you want to do because all the point that I was trying to say is that you want to get to the substructures of the syntactic objects. And, and doing this would be exactly the situation in which you declare that your syntactic objects are indecomposable. And so the, the co-product of each syntactic object would only have this trivial part, the t tensor one plus one tensor t. So you, you're, you're declaring that they are indecomposable. And if you declare that they are indecomposable, then you know, your decomposition of forest can only be put a, a bunch of connected components on this side and a bunch of connected components on the other side. And it would be then it would be exactly the opposite of the of your composition product. Okay. You, your composition takes the union of this two, and I just split half part of it this way, part of it the other place. But of course, as I said, this doesn't do what you want. It doesn't get, give you access to the to the deeper you know, structures inside the, the syntactic objects. So to get a better form of a product, you have to throw away this assumption that the, the syntactic objects are indecomposable. And you want to you know, start adding a bunch of terms which contain the, the decomposition where you take out one of the substructures. So let's see how to do that. So uh, there's, a, there's a way that uh, one can describe in terms of you know, where, where you get the substructures. So th this is uh, something that's that's used you know, in, in mathematics. One, co one construct this type of structures based on trees and other kind of graphs, trees, root and trees. So I, I give you a, a tree. So let, let, let's just, just, just take the, the case where uh, 
for your forest as a single component. Let, let me just say this for start as I, as I mentioned it here, that if I, if I tell you how to decompose a single tree, I, I also tell you how to decompose a forest because I can declare that the way I decompose a forest is just the product of the ways that decompose each tree in the forest, okay? So I, I just need to worry about how I'm gonna decompose a single syntactic object. Then I know how to decompose a word, a word space. So, so I, I do the following thing that I'm suppose that I that this is my syntactic object that I have. And I I take this tree and I, I go about pruning it by cutting some of the some of the edges. But I don't want to do that in any arbitrary way because I want to make sure that when I cut what falls off, so my, my tree is hanging there by, by the root, and I start cutting, and I want to make sure that what falls off are accessible terms. And, and it's like there's a very easy condition that guarantees that what falls off are accessible term, which means that the cut that you're making is an admissible cut, which means that you never cut twice on the same path from the root to one of the leaves. You can only cut at most once. So you look at all, all possible paths from your root to one of the leaves of the tree. And on each of these paths, either you don't cut anything or you cut only once. So this, this is an example. So you see, for example, if I if I wanted to look at this, so the blue lines of the cuts. So if I look at this last cut on the right, well, when I cut there, what falls off is, a, is an admissible term. But suppose that now I would also cut the, the edge just above that one. Then what falls off next is not an accessible term because the accessible term will contain everything, including, including the part that I've already lost. So I want to I wanna avoid that type of thing. So I only allow for those cuts where everything that falls off is, is an accessible term. Okay. So this is how, how I decompose a workspace. And so, so what, what, the, what I'm gonna do now is so tell you what goes on. So I, my output is gonna be two of the co-products is gonna be two things. So I have to tell you what goes on one channel of the output and what goes on the other channel of the output. So I, when I do this, obviously there's a bunch of stuff that falls off and there's something that remains attached to the root. So the bunch of stuff that falls off is the left channel of the co-product. What remains attached to the root is the right channel of the co-product. So my decomposition has, you know, has that form. Okay. The, I'm going to mention more later, but notice that, you know, the, the left and the right channel of the coprata don't have the same structure, right? The, the left channel of the coprata has a bunch of things in it. So it's a forest, it's not a tree. Of course, that will be the case when it's a tree, I mean, I only do one, one cut, okay? But in general, I can, I can, a bunch of things. But the, the, the thing that, do, that remains on the right channel of the coproduct is always a tree because it's always what remains attached to the root and it's a single component of what remains hanging there. So this, this, these two sides of the coproduct are not the same. And this, this means the, that this operation of coproduct is non co commutative. So it's the analog of being non commutative for multiplication. It's the fact that you cannot exchange the two channels without, you know, you don't have the symmetry if you exchange the two channels. And here, you don't have a symmetry if you exchange the two channels because they look different. They are structured in a different way. Okay. And can you repeat the, uh, yeah. for, just so I can make sure I understand this, can you repeat the, so you, you can take a, so an invisible cut is a set of subtrees, the tree that you're looking at that satisfies some property, right? Which makes sure that you don't, have the wrong kind of thing. So can you repeat that property again for me? Yeah, right. So the my co-product is a, is a sum over over all these admissible cuts. Right. Of what what is the forest of the of the accessible terms that have fallen off? Yeah, the admissible cut itself is a sub is a is a set of subtrees of the tree, where I guess no two subtrees overlap, or then one doesn't no two subtrees in the invisible cut contain each other. You mean that if, if if I if I look at the old forest and I do I mean if I look at the old workspace and I well, no no I'm just because you're looking at the coprat for a single tree yeah right you're trying to decompose a single tree because yeah, then yeah. you can lift it to the general right case yeah yeah so, so the, the yeah, yeah so the coprat of a single tree 
has a piece which is no longer a tree, is a is a forest. Right, I understand that, but I'm trying to understand again just what the definition of the admissible cut is. Because you mentioned there's you know what what the property is that makes we're not just choosing an arbitrary set of subtrees of the tree T. We're choosing one to satisfy the property to make it an admissible cut. Yeah. And so that property, if we're not understanding what that is, that just maybe that just ensures that no two of the subtrees in the admissible cut contain one or the other. Yeah. Is yeah. that it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. If I, yeah, that's exactly the condition that right. I cannot cut twice okay. on the same path from so the it, from the root to one of the. So there's so the, the sub trees that make one municipal cut yeah. are somehow disjoint from each other. Yeah, exactly. Because if yeah. one of them is a sub tree of the other, then when you have yes. already cut that, what you're left with is not an accessible term in the sense that you want. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There you're allowed to make a string of cuts, essentially. Mm -hmm. you, have a, you have a string of cuts, and you're not allowed to kind of go back. Like if I have here in this tree, I'm allowed to make a sequence of cuts, but I can't go, I can't really go back. Yeah, so so when when I write out this coproduct, right, I'm gonna have a sum, for example, I'm gonna have a term where you you only you only have the first cut, right? So this is gonna have just just this little blob on the left and the other thing on the right. Plus, like a second case where you have, I don't know, maybe the first two cuts, right? So you have two, two terms on the left and what's left on the right, plus, right? So you have, yeah, that's all the possibilities. You're listing all the possibilities. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a list yeah. and you essentially right. have a string out of it. Yeah. 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 yeah, and you write that as a formal sum. It's like a, a superposition, right, of all your, your possibilities. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me just make a, a small small comment here. Um, what when you when you describe what, what you're left with on the on the right side of the coproduct, so when you describe what 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 remains hanging from from the root, you have some some slightly different choices of, of how to to put that that term. Okay, um, these correspond to actually slightly different of algebra structures, which are related in interesting ways. And and they you might want to use one or the other depending on, on what you want to. And, and the fact that they are related to each other means that you can switch between one and, and the other. So one is to say that you know if you so let's let just just to say I'm extracting a single a single accessible term on the left. What do I do on the right? So one possibility is that I can just Shrink it's like in, in this in this old structure that I start with, I can just shrink the the thing that I've removed to a single verb. So what, what I'm left with is just what what was the root of, of the, the thing that, that I've removed, and just it just remains as a single vertex. This is useful when you, you know when you do this type of derivations like in terminal edge and so on. It's in, in linguistics we call it the trace. You want to keep of where where you are canceling the deeper copy when when you do internal merge, and especially for things like interface with semantics and things like this, you wanna you wanna keep the trace. Okay, but if you are just interested in, you're not so. But the issue is that if you wanna keep keep the trace, you need to label it in some way. Okay, so you need some kind of labeling, you know, of in. That this used to be an internal vertex. Now it's a leaf because you you remove the substructure, but it used to be an internal vertex. So you need some kind of labeling, labeling for for what 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 label you're gonna put there. Okay, and uh, and, and this is something that at some point you want to do, but if you if you're not for the moment worried about you no know, labeling uh, and and things like uh, you no know, data theory and all these kind of things, you you might as well not. Not keep if you, you just want the combinatorial structure and of the and then the action of merge in without keeping track of internal labeling, then you might as well not keep this this vertex and just actually delete where you cut and then there's a unique binary tree that remains and that that corresponds to you know, contracting you know, removing an intermediate vertex that remains you know not not binary binary and. And so that that is the other the other option that you have. So for the moment, I'm gonna first you know stick to the second option because I'm for now I'm not gonna discuss labeling. I, I will come back to those things later in but so for now my my term that remains attached 
does not have these these uh, vertices with the trace. Okay, this this is just purely a formalism, and it, th th there's some interesting things going on there because you no know, mathematicians know that there are inter interesting relations between these two forms, like the different forms of the coproduct, and I think they play they play a useful role. That there's actually something that I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the details also. I'm not going to tell you about that in this in this series of lectures, but hopefully it might make it into into our book if I continue to go into Okay. So let me let me ask a question about the um, co-product again. So with the case of an individual tree. So if I understand what you're saying, uh, then when we when we decompose the individual tree into the left channel and the right channel, in the left channel we have an invisible cup, so we have a set of subtrains. Right, and on the right channel we have what's left over. Now, just from that alone, we can't necessarily we can't necessarily know exactly how to reassemble the original tree because we don't necessarily know which, yeah which which, which thing was was, was attached right. to what exactly. Is that so, right? so this this is this is an argument in yeah. favor of keeping this trace right because if you if you keep this trace with with the label attached to it, if you want to be able to yeah if you want to be, exactly right. so that, that that's exactly the point of this difference right. like if you want to be able to keep track of that or if you don't need to keep keep right. track of that then then you know, one or the other okay. is the more convenient thing to do so that, that yeah. that's exactly all I'm saying yeah. right. got it thank you yeah okay so what what product is should one expect that this co-product operation should satisfy? Um, so, well, first of all, of course, you can you can have a, a, a question here, which is why do I want to do this kind of cuts? So, yeah, let me come back to this picture in a second. So, why why do I want to? Also consider these cuts where I get more than one accessible terms that falls off. Right? If I want to do like one, one internal merge, I, I just need one of them. Right? Why do I need? Why do I want to extract the possibility of extracting more than one? So this this is again something that you do want for for structural necessity. And however, this is again something that's not not completely sorted out yet. But uh, but I I think it, it also falls into place that this will, is going to have a linguistic consequence. But but let me tell you what structural necessity is first. So in principle, you could say I could. Why don't I just define the coproduct on the tree by extracting a single accessible term and and taking what is left? I do a, sing, a single cut and take what is left. Why do I need also the ones where I'm extracting, you know, a forest of accessible term? The thing is this that you know you you want uh, so if I have a, a multiplication, right, like like my product, as I said, my product, which is given by the disjoint union, is especially nice because it's both commutative and associative. Okay. And being associative for a for a multiplication operation means that it's especially well behaved on compositions, on iterations, right? And and so what if I want to require that my co-product is also especially well behaved under iterations? And and that is the co-associativity property. So you want the analog of the associativity of the product for the co-product. And and I'll, I'll show you more also in a moment more formally how you how you define that. But so the point is that if you if you want that for your co-product, then you are forced to only consider to also consider these other terms where you are extracting not as just a single accessible term at a time, but a bunch of accessible terms at a time. And so let me tell you what I think is the linguistic setting where, where you actually do need that. As well, is something that in in one's paper is called form set, and and which is which is a, not necessarily a binary operation, but it's it's a, it's a possibly an binary operation. It's not an binary merge. I'll, I'll discuss a moment why it's what that we don't have an binary merge, but it's an binary you know uh, you know structure formation of sets. And and that is exactly is exactly these these other terms of the product. And okay. 
And it has to do also with something else that, that's you know, in, in, in most, more, most recent papers is called box theory, which I'm, I'm still kind of trying to figure out, but it, it is related to these remaining terms of the book. And it had, they have to be there by structural necessity of the core susceptibility of the, of the whole part. Okay, so let's let's get into that you know a, a little bit more. So what I mean by saying that the the coproduct is co-associative, as I said, this is a property that has to do with iteration. So if you if you apply if you apply the operation twice, so you know when you when you say that a product is associative, okay, you have, you have three elements. You apply to two of them, keeping the third one as it is. And then you apply it again to the result of the first two and the third, or vice versa. So here you're going in the opposite direction. So you apply it once, and then to the two outputs, you apply it again on one of them, or you apply it again on the other one. And you want this to be the same. And, and then you see that you no, know, indeed, these, these terms are, are necessary. So the, the, the interesting here is that I'm going to discuss the, the action of merge on workspaces. The action of merge on what spaces really uses only the first term of this, this co-product, the, 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 the unary and the binary, the, the basically corresponding term internal and external merge. And, and the, all the other ones that I are, and if they are not used by the merge operation of what spaces, but they are used by these other, other parts of the of the of the linguistic model. I, I believe that's not, not completely okay. Um and, and finally, you know, let me say then what you mean by the fact that the, the uh, product and the coproduct are compatible. So now you no longer mean that they actually do exactly opposite things. That that was the case if you would declare your syntactic object to be in the composable. Now they are not in the composable, so it's not like you know applying the product and the coproduct. They are inverse to each other. They're not, but they have this compatibility that if you first take the product and then the co-product, or you first take the co-product and then the product, they they have the same, you, you get the same thing. There is a there is a little twist in the story, literally a twist, which is that when you when you apply the co-product first and the product later, you have to flip to two components. Why, why is that? Okay, one of them said that the co-product has two channels left and right, they don't look the same, okay? So they have different structure. What, what ends up in the left side and what ends up in the right side. So if I'm applying, you know, so if, if I'm, I'm, I'm on the left side of the first uh, identity, I, I, have take, I have two things as inputs. I multiply them, I get one thing. I co-multiply them, I, I get a bunch of two things, okay? On, on the right hand side, I'm, I still have to start with two things. So if I start with two things, I have two copies of the co-product. Each one of them produces two more things. So I end up with four things, uh, a list of four things, okay? But now these four things, so each pair comes from a co-product. So in each pair, the left part and the right part are different. But now I wanna combine them with a the product, but I wanna combine like with like. Okay, so these two things in the middle, I have to flip them. So that the, the left things are on the left and the right things are on the right, and then I multiply them. Okay, so I multiply things that look the same. Okay. And then what I get is something that can can match what I have on the on the on the left hand side. And in fact, the, the property of compatibility is that they do match. Yes. So the, the O times operation here is in the vector space, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything is on vector spaces because every time you apply a co-product, you end up with a sum of possibilities. Yeah. Right. Okay. So everything everything is is on 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 the underlying vector space. But it, it's purely a formality in order to keep track of the fact that a lot of these are you know a bunch of possibilities. And so you write everything as sums so that that goes goes through without without having any effort of you know checking what goes where. Well. Can I can I interrupt? I, I'm 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 a linguist, not a mathematician, and I'm not in the room. If nobody else wants this, then just don't do it. But I really lost you on the previous slide that began co-product is co-associative. I would be happy if you went through these two slides again. Yeah. Okay. I feel safer asking that if I were in the room and I could see 
who's smiling and who's frowning at me, but but I, okay. I, I, suspect, I suspect there may be other people who would be happy if you could do that. Okay, okay. No, 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 no problem. So no, what? So you you're okay with with a multiplication being associative, right? A multiplication being associative, right? I, I multiply two things and then I multiply them with a third one, or I multiply a thing and then I multiply it with the first one, and and I want those to be the same. Now you reverse the direction, right? You reverse the direction of everything. So you start with a single thing instead of the single in the multiplication, the, the, in the associativity of multiplication, the single thing is the last step. But now the single thing is the first step because coproduct goes in the opposite direction. So I, I give you a single thing and you hit it with the coproduct and you get you know, a collection of pairs of things, which are a pair of things is, is, a, is a composition, so it's an output of the coproduct. Now, on this pair of things, you can decide to hit the first one with another coproduct or hit the second one with another coproduct. Okay. I see. And you want these two things to be the same. Okay, that's helpful. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. thank you, but but if you could keep repeating what you said for the, for the previous eight minutes, getting back to the point where I asked the question, it would make me the happiest. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, right. I'm, no, no, then I said the other the other the other uh, condition. So this condition of co-associativity is the analog of the associativity for multiplication, just just going in in the reverse direction. Okay, and the other condition that you want is the compatibility between product and coproduct. And, and as I said, that, that's a little subtle because I'm not saying that these two operations are inverse to each other. And so I'm not saying that if you first multiply and then you co-multiply, you get the same thing. You don't because you know, when you co-multiply, you, you get a bunch of different possibilities, right? When not a single one. So really if you, if you do one multiplication and then co-multiplication, you don't you don't get what you start with. You get a bunch of possibilities. Maybe what you start with is one of them, but you know, in general, they're not inverse operations to each other. So how do you say that they are compatible operation? What you can say is that I can do two things. I can first take two things and multiply them together and then split them apart again. Or I can take two things, I can split apart each one of them and then multiply them again. Okay, and and so what I what I want is compatibility. Is that these two things are the same? But you know I have to be careful because when I take two things and I I co-multiply each one of them, I get you no know, a pair from the first one. I get a pair from the second one, but in each of these pairs, the left and the side the right side are different. They're different type of types of objects. So in order to then recombine them with multiplication, I want to recombine the two things that look alike and the two things that look alike. So I have to flip the, the pair in the middle so that the, the two left channels go together, the two right channels go together, and I multiply the two left channels together and the two right channels together. And that's my compatibility. And what I get at the end of doing this is the same as if I had first multiply the two things together and then co-multiply them again. So that that's what I want as a, as compatibility of these two operations, it, which is a little more subtle than just being inverse substitution. Okay. Yes. Um, the um, is there is there any significance to the fact that you know you know we began with kind of saying you know there's workspaces and then you have composition and decomposition. Is there any significance to the, you know, to, to what seems to be the case that the composition part is very straightforward, like you know how to put them together, but the decomposition part kind of starts, you know, it, it becomes more complicated and you have to, like how, how should, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, I, I guess linguists live in the composition part, right? So I like, I like, or maybe if I'm misunderstanding, but the decomposition part doesn't seem to be something that you overtly tend to do in linguistic. Theorizing. Yeah, no, no. It seems like it seems that it's algebraic necessity of dualizing the, the composition. Mm -hmm. 
and it's come about how should how, how yeah. no no you're you're right i mean so the the, the significance is exactly the fact that the, the so the decomposition is more you're right the decomposition is more interesting than the composition right this is actually the case very often with this type of uh, of algebraic structures that the, the decomposition is more interesting than the composition and the, the reason for that is precisely because the decomposition is reaching inside substructures and the composition is not and and the, the, and this is you know, the, the decomposition is exactly what gives you the possibility of describing you know the, the type of movement operations on, on sentences that require it requires you to reach for a substructure inside a syntactic object so, so the idea is that when we have internal merge or movement or whatever we begin with the workspace we decompose exactly. and then recompose exactly so okay. the action of the, yeah. yeah so you're, you're you're kind of you know, spoiling my punchline but you know the action of uh, of merge and work spaces is exactly going to be happening like that you produce your list of, of material that's accessible for merge by extracting the substructures through the coproduct. And then your merge kind of zooms in on, on one of the terms of the coproduct where you actually want to you know, grab that substructure and use it. And so, yeah, it's built into the merge operation is this extraction of substructures, which is done by the coproduct. Question. Can the coproduct be defined in such a way that um, the right channel ends up identical to the original tree? So the way you're thinking of the of extraction is simply copying. Uh, extraction, in some sense, is copying, and it's uh, it not if the right channel ends up being a not if not if the right channel ends up being the way you described. I mean, you were talking about in traces, but you in your illust illustrative examples. You didn't show the original tree. You showed it pruned in various ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, in the coproduct, you always have a term which is the primitive part, which is exactly where you extract the entire tree, right. and then you have just the trivial thing on the other side, right? And so you always have that possibility right. of extracting the entire tree, and and then yeah, that that's yeah. If you want to to think of that, you can think of that as creating a copy. So indeed, you're, you're exactly right. This is where the distinction between the um, repetitions and copies in, in, the, in the linguistics terminology is, is residing in the sense that you know, the, the different you know, objects, static objects that you have in the workspace to begin with that might be isomorphic to each other, they are not copies, they are repetitions. Copies are exactly created by this operation that extract substructures in the in the coproduct and the places them on this left channel of the coproduct. That's the, the the receptory of the copies. So in this way, you know, the an advantage of formulating it this way is that you never mix copies and repetitions. So you don't have to worry about having like this uh, form copy kind of binary uh, Boolean valued function that labels which one is a repetition and which one is a copy because they never are in the same place. The copies are always in this you know, output of the of the coproduct that is one of the channels and you know that those those are copies and the repetitions are inside your workspace so you don't have to worry about having to keep labels to distinguish yes. thank you does, does, does this mean that the uh, um you know there was this idea that you know you have one merge operation and the internal merge versus external merge are basically just the same thing it just happened it, it is a question of what you're merging I'll, I'll come to that in a moment it, it, is, it is indeed the case you have we have a merge operation that that specializes to... so it's not it because now it a little bit looks like that there is a composition or you know product or composition and then there is core product or decomposition yeah and one of them is external merge and one of them is internal merge in a way like product no, is no, just no. internal merge. Product, and... product is here is is just the formation of your workspace. The, it's not it's not a merge operation because you know you place different components as separate. You don't you don't merge them. Mm -hmm. So both external in this one once you have your your workspace, yeah. both external and internal merge are, are just going to come from from the same operation. You're confusing the tree for the forest again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so um, okay. Ooh. <laughs> All right. um, so so I'm going to just very quickly show you the formal definition of, of this of algebra structure that I just that I just went through. I mean, I've already explained what all the things are, but no, basically the the way that you find it, you no know, presented in the, in the math textbook. Is is that you know you, you have a certain you start with the vector space and then on this vector space you put some operations you have a multiplication you have a unit for multiplication and you have a co product for multiplication there's a corresponding notion of co unit for that co multiplication we play the analog of the unit for, for multiplication and you have a, a an antipode an antipode is a, is like a is like an inverse type of operation that relates also relates multiplication and multiplication in a different way than what I just said I'll just say no yeah. more and then you ask the the nice properties about this this uh, operation so you require that multiplication is associative the multiplication is co-associative that unit and co-unit behave well with respect to the other operation, and that the antipode is creating an additional relation between multiplication and co-multiplication. And, and all these properties can be conveniently expressed by some diagram. So if you look at my you, you always find these things you know, written in this type of form, which means that you, you when you apply this operation, you go around the arrows of these diagrams. And if, for example, if you want to say that your multiplication is associative, you say that if you if you go around one way or you go around the other way, following the arrows, you get you get to the same thing. Okay. And and similarly, if you want to say that something is a unit, you say that no, if you apply it and then you multiply, you multiply, you, you get you get uh, the, the, the you apply it to one or the other, and then you multiply, you get the same thing. So all these proper formal properties, algebraic properties, they are expressed by this type of diagrams. What is the, the advantage of doing this is that you see immediately the relation between, for example, let me show you this. This is the co-multiplication properties, co-associativity and co-unit, and this, these are the multiplication properties. So, I mean, you see that, you know, the only thing you're doing here is reversing all the errors, right? So the, you're just saying, that the, when you say that these two operations have to have nice properties, you're just saying that if you revert all the arrows, you get the properties of one from the properties of the other. Yes. So uh, when, when I think about it, the vector space, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, yes. because it's 130, so I think maybe the yeah, answer is this okay. question, and then we continue tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Should yeah. I continue? Right no, there? no, no, yeah, ask your question, answer it, but then. Okay, so let, let me just or, yeah, uh, finish the point. Right. So what I, what I said is, as the as the compatibility of multiplication and co-multiplication is, again, this kind of diagram. If you go around the arrows one way or you go around the arrows the other way, you get the same thing. And the only thing I want to say something about it is the fact that I will not be talking about the antipode structure. And the reason why I'm not going to be talking about the antipode structure is that certain kind of alpha algebras have an antipode that comes to you for free in the sense that it's completely determined by the other properties. Normally, it's not. Normally, it's an additional property that, that gives more, more tight. It, it, gives, it kind of tightens the relation between multiplication and co-multiplication because there's an, it, it creates an additional relation. And that relation, if you look at it, it's almost saying that multiplication and co-multiplication are inverses to each other, but they are inverses after composing with this with this uh, antipode map. Okay, so it's telling you exactly by how much they are not in inverses to each other. And and the point is that you no, know, in in certain of algebras that are called you no know, graded graded connected, and and these ones of the of the workspaces is one of them. You don't have to worry about this additional thing. It's not an additional constraint. It's just it's just uh, determined by the the rest of the structure. So it's uh, it's it's like more tight and you know type of, of algebras and it, it, that are usually called combinatorial of algebras or something like that. And that they they have they have these additional properties for free. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. So the conclusion for now is that work spaces are about algebra. Okay. So <laughs> I think. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to wait until tomorrow to tell you what merges <laughs> now that that no that we can say what it is in terms of these of this algebraic structure on uh, our work spaces and the point is that we kind of has all, all these various cases of merge and whatever they just come from from this structure directly. Thank you.
I have to ask the question before. Yeah, yeah. It's so, so I see why it's formed and why you have a vector space with top properties. So, in form, in previous um, uh, treatments of mathematizing, you know, syntactic versions, that people have normally treated it as a, instead of a hop space, you treat it as a box space. Uh, you know, or, or 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 you add like an adjoint vector that gives you a lot of scalars, turn it into a Hilbert space or something like that. So, I'm wondering what the, what there is. Like the difference is between conceiving it in this way when something like the box space has like a unique decomposition operator that lets you kind of use the inner product to get back out of substructure, right? So, um, so I'm wondering what, what, why when you use the box uh, space, maybe, maybe space. If, if your if your uh, vector space also has some kind of uh, inner product, yeah. yeah. You would have to say what in what sense that additional property has some compatibility with this algebraic structure. I'm not sure, you know, what what would be like a good yeah. also I mean here you don't you don't naturally have any other problem. So we'll we'll we we'll get we we'll get to a point where you do have and I know why you're asking this question, <laughs> because of course a, a use of vector spaces in in linguistics, right, is you know through well, as a as well as for semantics where you do you know, measure proximity in terms of some inner product. Well, I, sure. I, I'll I'll but I'll come to that. But the, the thing is that you know that's a different type of of property. It's more something that allows you to evaluate proximity relations. Okay. Well, I, I've been in, in, the, in the past when people have been trying to sort of embed the structure with the vector spaces. They've done so such that the vector space has this unique, I, people call it an unbinding, where I say I, I get a tree and I want to find a particular like daughter of left yeah. daughter. I, I, so hopefully, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm going to talk about that in the sense that, you know, when one way, one of the, of the things we look at in the interface between syntax and semantics. Is exactly a situation where on the side of semantics we have something like that, you know, the kind of yeah. vector space with with some like in the broader structure and so on. And now you are you are mapping. You you have a map that goes from syntax to semantics. So you do realize an, an image of the syntactic structure inside your semantic space. And there you actually have this type of, but it, it's sort of happening. So it you know, the, the, I'll talk about this more. But the, the picture in mind is that. You have a, a purely computational structure, which is syntax. And it has this type, so this type of algebraic structure that I'm describing is sort of modeling the computational structure of syntax. On the side of semantics, we have something which is much more, you know, things that have to do with, you know, proximity relations, similarity proximity relations. This is more like a, a topological metric type of structure and, and not a computational structure. I know you know, I, this, this is kind of rough, you know, some sound semanticist. So, so I, <laughs> but that's a particular reference example you had in mind. Well, like, uh, so no, I'm very good. Yeah. Well, okay, so that's one case, right? Well, so, then, uh, but yeah, but that's the, broken in one respect. In lots of respect, well, the tool of talk about that. I just mean, it, it seems like we have an issue where decomposition does not give you out a unique, a unique element, right? So yeah. I'm wondering what, like, if you want that, there are vector spaces where there is this kind of product and then it's not inverse per se. You don't want that. You don't want that. There's many accessible terms. There are. If, if, you, if you only got one, you only have one movement. That's it. No other positive. It wouldn't be, you would never get ambiguity. Uh, okay, so to deal with that, then we must have this like community of associative offer. Okay, I see. Right. You got, I, 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 I have to talk about that. So, so maybe, yeah. uh, uh, maybe when I get to that that part, we can we can revisit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so we accept this annoyance in our because. I think it's going to come up. Gives up. you the half alpha attempt. Like it's giving you a way to do. Uh, it's not annoying. Do you end up with this list? It's, it's a bigger thing, but it's not actually. Yeah. There's a list of possible ways to find accessible terms that could move. And then you use something like minimal search to, if you want to use that, pick out the one you want to grab. I, I meant annoyance in the sense that it doesn't give you, it's not quite, like you said, it's not quite an, an inverse. Right. It's not an inverse. Well, I mean, so, it has a, you know, 
It is giving you out something where you can always know. have your cake and eat it too. Well, that's what I mean by annoying, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, but yeah, we, we, we should yeah. get back to, we should yeah. get back to these questions. Okay, okay. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. 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 Yeah.